Sheriff Batwell showed up just before dinner time, and I had Eric on my hip when I answered the door. And they pulled him from my arms, and he had his little arms outstretched and crying for me while they were handcuffing me. You know, from his three-year-old perspective, uh, the last time there were a bunch of cops in the house, it was a really, really bad day. They were back. I never seriously thought that they would convict me. I thought, oh, in fact, I had planned my life. Oh, you know, what am, I, what am I going to do after this? Where am I going to live? And a very small part of me thought, well, you know, what if? But the bulk of it, I would say most of my thinking, most of my feeling was that this can't possibly happen. Um, what could they? What could there be out there that would point to this? Mm -hmm. When they announced the time, the aggravated life, I collapsed literally. My my butt hit the chair real hard. It, I, if the chair hadn't been there, I would probably just fall on the floor. Mm -hmm. I was that surprised. Um, the weight of it. The uh, the shock. Um, it, I, I I didn't think. From my chair, I didn't see where he had made a case. Everything had been refuted. Everything had been challenged. And the things that hadn't been challenged were just so preposterous that um, it, was, it was almost it was just like, and? You know, that, that's it? They went into a stacked deck. I, I, in hindsight, I don't see how they could have won. Prison is prison. It's no different for me or it was no different for me than anybody else who goes in there. Um, you can snivel that you don't deserve to be there, but the things that I had to go through were identical to the guy right next to me who might have got busted, you know, moving several keys of coke or something. He's got to be there too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go through the same stuff, you deal with the same people. It has rougher moments. Um, mostly prison is boring and loud and disrespectful and uh, designed to eat up time. Um, you don't get to go where you want to go. You can't eat what you want to eat. Um, <clears throat> it's not supposed to be a nice place mm -hmm. and the, the cliche that's made famous, which is appropriate, is that you go there as punishment. You're not supposed to go there for punishment. If you think it's going to make anybody better, um, good luck with that. My first day inside, um, the way they used to have it set up, where you picked up your boots, that's after you're stripped and uh, you're given a pair of state boxers, but you pick up your boots next. And I remember the guy in front of me was standing there getting his boots, telling the size and all that stuff. And uh, I counted 13 stab wounds on his back. And it was a very sobering moment that this is a very um, serious place. These folks aren't playing around. I benefited in a way because when I went to prison, I was 32 years old. So I was a grown man. I wasn't one of these... Uh, 19, 20, 22 year old, I call them kids, they're legally adults, but you have a different world view when you're 22 mm -hmm. than when you're 32. And uh, an old con knew me because of all the media attention, and that's about all he knew about me, but he just said, you, you'll do okay, just in the beginning, uh, keep your mouth shut and your eyes open. And that was really good advice. I started going to the gym, just as I'd done in the world, a good way to fill time, a good way to stay in shape, all that kind of stuff. And I started seeing a guy in there, We just because of our different schedules, however, we used to kind of show up at the gym at the same time, and we just, and within a couple months, we were working out together. Our, our schedules just meshed. And he had a life sentence, and he had just finished his 20 calendar when I showed up, and I was about to start my 20 calendar. 
and he didn't lecture me, but every now and then he'd give me a little uh, pearl of wisdom. And uh, one weekend, a guy hanged himself in a cell. And uh, my friend told me that he'd seen a bit of that, you know, in his time down there. And he said, if you don't have anything to hang on to, doesn't matter what it is, you'll end up hanging yourself. And that something that you hang on to, it can be anything that I believe the examples he used were an old car you want to restore that's sitting in your you know, dad's barn or something, or maybe a marriage you want to fix. And he said, like with me, pointing at me, or with you, he said, it's your son. And he was the most important thing in my world. 12, 13-ish, he's starting to get into puberty, he's starting to be a little bit of a young guy, and he wrote me a letter and said that he didn't want to come <coughs> down to the penitentiary anymore to see me. So I wrote him a letter back, and I said, I'll honor your wishes, but you come down here, and you look me in the eye, and you tell me that, and we'll go from there. So on the next uh, ordered visit, um, he stared at the floor and told me this thing. And uh, I, uh, I told him he could come back and see me anytime he wanted, but I told my sister-in-law to take care of my son. And we had like a 90 second visit because I walked away. Around 2001, 2002, uh, I got noticed that um, the most important thing in my life was being taken away from me and that he was having his name illegally changed and he was being adopted by my uh, sister-in-law and her husband. Good people, raised him, nothing wrong with them, but um, you could say it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Losing Chris didn't break me. Uh, being convicted and sentenced didn't break me. And Spending 14 or 15 years down there didn't break me. But when uh, I lost my son, and that broke me. Didn't see any reason for anything, and I literally cried out to God. Um, I, I got nothing. I'm, I'm bankrupt. Show me something. You there? You know, I got, you know, I got nothing. A week, 10 days later, I don't know when it was. I had a really nothing day, just like all the hundreds and hundreds before it. Uh, nothing happened at work fancy. Food was not that unusual. Time in the gym was another day, no big deal. Work was the same old, same old. So uh, I decided to uh, call it a day, turn off the little lamp next to my bunk, put on the headphones and go up and down the dial on the radio once or twice and go to sleep. And without any um, preamble, warning, uh, no flags at all. I was suddenly bathed in this blinding, golden, indescribable light. It's all I could see. And uh, I, I, I heard this roaring in my ears block that everything else that I now have heard described as a mighty wind or many rushing waters, or whatever you want to call it. And um, I felt like I was uh, weightless. I was like just floating above the bunk, and I was experiencing bliss. Just, um, I was very, very at peace. I was excited and thrilled. Um, I was ecstatic. I was infinitely calm. It, 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 I know this sounds contradictory, but it was just um, the most fantastic, wonderful sensation I've ever had. I knew exactly what it was. I didn't have to ask. It was just as plain as the sun in the sky. I knew it was the presence of God. Things began 
to happen and I became a little more mature and a little more aware and a lot more grounded and um, I didn't like prison but I was used to it mm -hmm. and uh, I had moments of happiness. John Rayleigh, very few people can look to somebody and say, excuse me, that you owe your life to them. And uh, I can say that about John. I can point to him and say, there's the guy. That's, that's, that's the guy who got me out. Um, he said, even if all this DNA stuff collapses, I'm never going to stop. I'm not going to go up. There's, there's something always to be done. He had literally th thrown his life into this. And he didn't know me from the man in the moon. He had never, all he did was read the file that Nina had pushed his way. And uh, um, when somebody does something like that for you, you're never the same.